we need as many people as possible rolling the word sustainability, sustainable development goals off of their tongues. And that comes from education. Education is something that should be available to everybody. Again, green, purple, tall, short, young, old, whatever. We need to make sure that we are sustainably inclusive that people know about water systems, that people know about supply chain, food sourcing, everything we need to know about the climate, innovation. We need to educate and we need to be inclusive. We need to provide internships. We need to go out of our way to not do the thing that's easy. Oh, let's just ask so-and-so or so-and-so because they know so-and-so and so-and-so, no. Talk to somebody and bring in, seek people, regions, products, services, whatever you don't know about. Wilhelmina Jewel Sparks is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Jewel is a global executive who has worked in both corporate and startup environments for over 20 years, preparing markets and launching innovative products and services in science, technology, retail, and food industries. She is the founder of United 17 Venture Lab and CEO of BitHouse Venture Group, which is a global business development cultivator fostering collaboration and innovation culture amongst corporates, innovators, investors, governments, and community. She is a trained biotechnologist, global market strategist, and strategic communications expert from the United States based in Germany and Copenhagen. She is an active technology scout, angel investor, and venture partner focused on sustainably innovative technology solutions for corporate venture capital funds and government entities as the need for customer engagement, growth, digitalization, and corporate innovation increases. She serves on several global advisory boards, the IADAS, which stands for International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences, amongst others, is also a guest lecturer of the Corporate Innovation at WHU Otto Biesheim School of Management, and is an active advisor, mentor to several startups and accelerator programs focused on IoT, AI, mobility, agri-food, retail, entertainment, fashion, sustainability and health. Jewel is the founder of the AgTech Food Tech Summit and was the founder of Food und Food Tech Group of the Deutsche Startup Association, the German Startup Association. Bridging the gap by connecting the dots is her motto. Jewel, welcome to the show. Hey Mark, how are you today? Most excellent. And it's so good to see you. Just for our listeners, I want them to know we're friends. We've been friends for a while. Our paths have crossed numerous times. Um, I think that the, the big first time was when you invited me to speak at your ag tech food tech event in Berlin. Um, um, was it the factory Berlin? Is that what the name yeah, of the location, the, the spot was? It was at the factory yeah. and actually it was before they had actually completed, you know, the whole downstairs areas when they first kind of embarked upon uh, Berlin, actually. So that was, those were good times. Yeah, that was a, a, a wonderful time and we had a great event and it was real big. You um, used to be the global head of innovation and scouting for Metro Group and media. that was when be, before the the merger or the separation of the media marked and Saturn groups where there was a big heavy technology focus as well uh, in along with Metro um, because of your technology background and things and and your specialty towards food and uh, it was the beginning of also kind of starting collaboration with InFarm, which was a big new vertical farm kind of in grocery store setup as well 
And then shortly thereafter, we saw uh, Obama together and seeds and chips in Milan. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, and then South by Southwest, uh, yeah, uh, and we actually, yeah. we actually, yeah, we, we, we shared some expensive accommodations there and had a good time. Uh, um, I had a booth and, and you uh, were out and about crazy speaking and doing all sorts of stuff there. And then I think, and I might be wrong, the last time we saw each other was at Mobile World Congress four years from now in Med in Barcelona, right? That was is that absolutely it? correct. And that was like in 2019. Yeah, and then, and, and then uh, uh, during that time, we actually went to a cool, uh, a really cool party. And I can't remember, it was at a brewery. It was one of uh, Barcelona's yeah, was, oldest, yeah. Yeah, it was the time. IOT, it was the IOT stars uh, event. And it was uh, Tech EU was one of the sponsors. Remember that? That was cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was way cool. And then uh, Os, Os, Osen Lunny, one of my other friends, he was like the DJ there and a speaker. He was also speaking uh, um, in Barcelona. And so, I mean, our paths have crossed. We've had some good times eat, eating together, chatted, hung out, but also been very serious about food and, and, and doing things. And I'm so glad that finally with your busy schedule, you were able to uh, to uh, give me some of your time that we could go into a little bit of just a deep dive conversation. I want to remove some bias and make some sense of the world and and and, and uh, catch up with you if that's okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And Mark, you know, I always have time for you. Now you're the one that's always busy. Let's let's be honest with our audience. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, but I am happy to be able to speak to you as well today on International Women's Day. I really thought that I didn't even put two and two together, but I was like, oh my God, what a better person. There's not a better person to actually take the time and spend time with virtually than you. So thank you very much for having me as a guest. You're most welcome. And yes, you're right. It is International Women's Day and uh, it's time to flip the switch. Let's change some shit up because uh, uh, the, the, the way the world's been going in, in the past is just not working for us anymore. And, uh, as you, I, I think, you know, this very well, I think we've had some conversations about the strong female influence in my life and, and how I feel about, you know, uh, sustainability and that women and girls are really the, the, the biggest lever, uh, of humanity to, to draw down all the human suffering, the global problems, the things in our world to get us back into a better operating system, a world of more uh, inclusiveness and just, you know, just get us back to, or not even back, get us into a better future for humanity, you know, with some, some, some strong leadership. Yeah. Um, I think that, I don't know, it's, you know, someone I'm doing a talk tonight actually on Clubhouse and it's these amazing women that are in virtual reality and augmented reality. And one of the speakers brought up this very important point, you know, as we were preparing and she's like, you know, when programming, for example, in tech first began, I mean, it was a woman that was the backbone. And somehow in the process, it's throughout this journey or the evolution, all of a sudden, it was kind of like now the question is asked, can women really do the job? And so the question, I mean, it brought up something that I didn't even think about. It's like a lot of these like innovations or a lot of these um, like tasks and skill sets. I mean, women were a part of the solution from all along and sometimes at the very beginning. But somehow, like, I don't know, like it just started the whole like various career paths and things like that just started getting dominated. Um, and maybe it's because of the, the nature or the communication style, maybe, you know, a lot of us, you know, today where we're talking about gender diversity and inclusion and things like that. Sometimes, you know, they always, a lot of people refer to like someone's presentation of themselves or their communication style and things like that. So maybe things just kind of switched up due to like the assertiveness of men and maybe some of the kindness or the gentleness of women over time. And, and then yet there seems also to be an issue when we speak up 
and when we also address what our skills are and sometimes if we do if we do that then we're kind of like oh aggressive or difficult to work with and but I would never say that about like and a lot of people would never say that about their male friends or colleagues if they just demanded what they knew that you know they wanted or could do so that was a little bit of a tangent, but I just kind of wanted to say it because you were talking about we need like women to kind of like reboot things. And I just know that we're always there. I mean, we even give birth to everybody. So I mean, yeah, yeah. so it's really interesting. Um, I don't know what's what's been happening or why things have happened, why this um, this imbalance um, has occurred. And now more than ever, of course, the pandemic has shown just how like whack things are, just how like imbalanced or unbalanced the systems are. And also a lot of the pain and the suffering that a lot of individuals go through. I mean, I think for people to be locked down all this time, I mean, there's your introverts and your extroverts. Some people have been able to handle it well and some people they haven't. And so, I mean, it's just been a very, very sensitive time, I think for everybody regardless on which side of the spectrum um, you stand. So lots of healing definitely needs to be done. Absolutely, for sure. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't take the time to, to, to put themselves in another person's shoes or to think about the, the bigger picture. And, and in reality, and this is kind of what I, besides talking about our, 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 friendship over the years and places where our paths have crossed. Uh, really what I was saying is that you the one who invited me to your summit, Ag Tech Food Tech, and um, gave me the opportunity to speak there. That was your event, woman led, woman run, a lot of women help in that. I, I loved it. And I was honored to, to have a seat at the table or a voice at the table and to, to uh, to take part of that. And I know that you uh, over the years really look for uh, not only diversity, but the best voices. It's not necessarily say, okay, it's just got to be a woman. It's just who, who's the best in tech, who's the best in that. And, and, and many times it is women, especially in the food industry. And, and we really need to recognize that. Second, Innovators Magazine, 1.5 Media, Susan Robertson, she's the, she's the head of that. And uh, along with her husband, a strong, strong powerhouse and uh, seeds and chips. Sharon Citone is not the head, but she was really running all the speakers and getting people to the event. I remember a horrible thing, and maybe I, I can't remember if you ever got your coat back, but uh, at seeds I and did. chips, you, you did. Okay, great. So at seeds and chips, you lost a very beautiful and expensive coat, and uh, it was precious to you, but then you ended up getting it back. But Sharon kind of, you know, she organized a lot of the speakers, the events, and uh, was that she's moved on to uh, sustainability, I believe, is the company uh, now and does a bunch Deloitte. of other things. She's with Deloitte what? now. She's with Deloitte, with Deloitte. now. Okay. She does a lot. They're their accelerator program. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just on and on. I could go on for hours of the wonderful women who are really uh, stepping up to the plate, send, send, setting the example paving the way, also empowering other women and girls, not be afraid. There, there's plenty of room, take it, take over. Let's, uh, men are fucking up the world. We need to get, we need to get back on no, a better balance. No, so. no, we all need <laughs> each other. We all need each other. But you know what? I do want to go back on one point. Uh, you were talking about, there's a lot, usually the women that are behind the scenes and really the nuts and bolts, you know, um, just a, a bullet point about you being, um, a speaker at the Ag Tech Food Tech Summit, you know, that is an event that I basically, I self-financed the whole time. You know why? Because no one would give me money, but everyone else who has, um, you know, you know, after me, you know, there's tons of resources and money that people are getting for these types of events. But I was thinking about this today, you know, like I was very grateful I guess for my past life as a molecular biologist and in biotech, because it's those, that career actually that has been providing um, for me, I'd say the last 10 years, because there is this very interesting um, 
I don't know what's going on in the world, but I mean, I see tons of my colleagues or, or people that I know, and some, some of them have experience, some of them aren't really that experienced, but I mean, they, there's not a lack of resources for, for certain people and, and if they're male. And then also, also I think about some of my um, female friends and colleagues who, who can hide behind um, either their blonde or brunette hair and their lack of melanin in their skin. And so I think that that's something that you, when you said putting yourself in someone else's shoes, that's something that's been a very interesting experience for me to kind of see how like the food and the food tech and all this stuff has transformed and the resources that are out there, but resources that still, if people had a choice and they do have a choice, they still actually have not chosen to give it to me. And I'm just very grateful that I have my own personal resources to be able to do this and be able to bring to the forefront uh, different events where there's all types of people, best voices, no matter what they look like, no matter what gender. And this just speaks to having a very globally diverse ecosystem and friend network that I've had throughout my life and throughout my career. And it's really a blessing. And I wish that I could also meet more people like that. And so things wouldn't be so difficult when I'm not sitting in front of those that I know and those that have been a part of my life. I, I totally agree. And I, I think that uh, one thing, if those who don't know you, it's uh, you're persistent. You're not going anywhere. You're sticking around. You're, you're, you're passionate about what you do. And you're going to be there no matter what, and you'll find a way to do it. And um, I think you, I hope you, over the years that it's gotten better and better that you've seen more support, more funds, and, and that maybe even during this time that that uh, of the pandemic that you've seen more people come come back to you to say, hey, really, we remember what you told us or what you were trying to tell us before. Now's the time. Can you help us? put this into the practice and, and that those things continually to come uh, uh, more and more so that you would really see even more fruits because you're such a, a wonderful person. What you do, I think is really needs to, is a, such a benefit to the world and, and, and everybody we know, but also those around the world that really need not just that empowerment, but also uh, that, that ag tech, food tech, technology in, in, in any respects uh, mixed in with a strong uh, empowered woman really someone there to set the example um, that leads me really to my first question <laughs> and yeah yeah um, it, it, we already know the answer basically you know Germany Copenhagen from the uh, from America um, are you a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without divisions of humanity one from another without nations borders divisions separation of us uh, one from another i am a global citizen um as you know i've come a long way since those days in kansas um and lived on all the coasts and in the middle of the u.s lived in japan um, now, like, as you said, I'm in Germany and Copenhagen. I also spend some time in Sweden, um, and Austria and, um, the world without borders would be great. Um, unfortunately, the sad part about the pandemic is that the borders are becoming like from a digital perspective, it's borderless, you know, so that's good. But that's something I think that me as a person that's been in tech, I've always like utilized the, that the technology like vehicle to be to cross borders as I'm always about minimizing barriers to entry. Um, but one interesting scenario that has happened um, as we've seen over the last year, and I specifically saw it um, last year because I had a home in Copenhagen and in Berlin and just being able to get back to Germany or go from Germany back to my place in Copenhagen. It was, it was so, it was such a traumatic um, experience from a travel perspective um, that to be honest, I've totally lost my appetite from to go across border in a physical way. Uh, but definitely in a digital way, I'm all about like streamlining those processes. Um, look, you and I are talking, you're in some other part of the Germany. 
Um, and this is how, I mean, I'm able to talk to people in New York. I'm able to talk to everybody now um, virtually. Um, but I think physically showing up is definitely not going to get easier even once, you know, things kind of lift as a result of the pandemic. I think we'll realize how much we've changed as individuals, which I also realized, like I used to be on the plane like three times a week, totally loved it because I could see different people. I could breathe like different air. I could like sense and like really kind of see what the different cultures were, what the different like motivations were of people, like literally lay my eyes on people. But even me, when I had to go from here to Copenhagen, I mean, it took like a week for me to like recover just because it was such a process. The mask, the worrying about like my neighbor in the seat next to me, like were they as safe as I was? Were they cared about like who they would interact with or if they had the virus and if they could give it to, or were they hopping on an airplane knowing that they were positive? So, I mean, it's like, I just feel like I don't even have the appetite to even want to travel. And I never thought that I would say that because that's been so much a part of my life for years. Um, so that's, I think we're all gonna realize that we've changed a lot without even knowing it once things oh, really- for sure. We're, we 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 the whole world's changed and and uh, I don't I absolutely don't want to go back. I want us to truly make that digital transformation. I want us to um, have broadband as a as a human right for everyone and kind of get us up to speed with our exponentially growing world so that these such minuscule small viruses or problems can't have such a big ripple effect on how humanity interacts one with another that we've uh, advanced as a civilization as humanity in, in a way that uh, we're adept and have the tools to to deal with those things and not to um, just perpetuate human suffering and uh, our, our, and perpetuate us talking about our global grand challenges instead of acting on it, uh, actively solving those problems uh, for the future. Um, there is one really other big question. So you, you've you been doing this for quite some time. You've been involved in this space for uh, a long time and you, you touched upon it in, in, in your, your kind of some of the things that we talked about before and as well as the global citizen, but how have you weathered this whole pandemic time and this whole Black Lives Matters and the uh, crazy inauguration in the US and the Brexits and all the other uh, craziness that's been going on in the world? And did any of that, that skills or knowledge or that wisdom that you had before help you be more resilient and in those places that it didn't, um, what were some of your learning lessons? What were some of the things you touched upon a few of them? And so I'd like you to bring those out. I, I do know, and I don't know if you, you, you don't need to talk about it, but you started a, a podcast and done a few episodes called Pandem, which is, I guess, Pandem. short uh, for pandemic. Yeah, Pandem uh, Files. And so just get, catch us up to speed and tell us how, were you more resilient? Were you also, I mean, I, you know, I kind of hear both, but I'd like to get, get caught up a little more. So Mark, the truth is, you know, um, my first job out of college was in Japan. So I spent four years in Japan and now, you know, the Japanese, they don't touch people when they greet. So to be honest, um, I also realized like, actually I was kind of grateful when the pandemic happened because actually I realized throughout my life, um, I've had to unfortunately shake people's hand or give people hugs when I really haven't wanted to, when I really had just wanted to look at them and say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good to see you today. So uh, in one sense, I've kind of been very grateful for the pandemic uh, from a personal space perspective. Um, also um, on my Myers-Briggs, I've, I've known for since 1990, um, seven that I'm an INTP, so I'm introverted. So I've also been very um, happy uh, that I don't have to see people and I can justify like that I don't have to personally see people. Um, and so it's kind of been good for me. Um, I think the challenge has been is it's one thing to not see people because you don't want to. It's another thing when you're forced to not when you're forced not to see people. And so I do realize that every once in a while when I would say I would creep out 
in terms of like wanting to meet with a business colleague or have a cup of coffee and not being able to do that, although it's very infrequently, uh, that's when I kind of realized, hey, wait, hold up, wait a minute, the world really has changed. Um, and then being here and reflecting on like all the stuff that was happening in America with um, George Floyd and stuff like that um, during the pandemic and being still and really me not having to go above and beyond um, to try to prove to other people that I either deserve an opportunity or that I should also have a seat at the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I actually really had some aha moments and it became really real. The, 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 the reason actually why I, after being back in the States um, since um, I, my job in Japan, why after I think it was like 17 plus years, where I was like, I need a break. And the first place, it actually made me realize why I left America and went and came to Europe. And um, and in Europe, it's not like they like are doing kumbaya moments or embracing me, like, you know, anyway. But the deal is, it's one thing I think to be in a different country when you're definitely not from that country, when you're not a national of that country and people bring up, oh, you're American and we're German, it's versus, being in your own country and people constantly questioning what are you doing here and i really want to say what are you doing i know i'm here i'm like native american and i'm black i mean my family actually has land we have a farm in alabama um, i'm here because i actually am american i'm american i'm black american i'm native american and i belong here but i mean that's it's kind of like an oxymoron you know, to be in your own country and to be qualified for jobs or to walk into a, a bank account and people look at you like you're crazy, you know, and, and that you don't have, you know, or, you know, they think that you have to be in a certain place or they try to discriminate against you um, versus being here. So, I mean, for me, it was great to see that everybody in America started to have this aha moment. There was this opportunity for people to be able to speak up and to embrace their whole selves and not be like, you know, hide out or if you had lighter skin to try to like make yourself in a way that where people aren't questioning you or discriminating, trying to hide in, you know, with the, with the mix and stuff like that. Um, and then being in Europe, um, what I also realized, though, what's been kind of interesting being here, I don't think America realizes how much Europeans or the rest of the world looks at what they're doing to figure out how they need to act or different trends or the way they need to treat people. So what's been kind of interesting is I think being in Europe, um, you know, I mean, if they some of the Europeans see that in America, they weren't so good to brown skin people or whatever. I think sometimes whether people admit it verbally or not, I think they're like, well, you're in the US, they aren't really good to brown people. So why do we really need to be good to brown people? And to be honest, I think I've experienced some of this in the tech and innovation field. I mean, I come from San Francisco, Silicon Valley. There's very few people who actually have come from San Francisco working in tech in Berlin. And the fact that I'm not included in a lot of these conversations a lot of these venture capital like being brought to the table when they want to assess like startups and things like that like to completely ignore that there's like literally like someone from the root of where all this stuff happened who's been working in diversity and technology since literally 2007 and all these like diversity and inclusion things in tech happening and still I don't get a call or people have events and then I email them on LinkedIn or email them in the mailbox and then they ignore me but then they pop something on LinkedIn about how successful their event was and it's a whole bunch of women but there's no brown women and there's no really no Americans there and then I say oh, hey you know I tried to contact you uh, but I didn't hear anything and then they contact me say oh I'm sorry did you send a message oh I'm so sorry I missed that so this stuff still happens, but it happens in a different way. You know, now it's like me being American in the European society. And I think what's dangerous about, I feel, um, people's lack of awareness of me and the impact that I have, whether it's political, whether it's financial, you know, whatever, uh, is that um, 
I think it's pretty sad. I think because it, it would only enhance what they're doing. Nobody's trying to take over what anybody's doing. I'm just trying to enhance it and to, to and I look at things. I'm in Europe. When in Europe do as Europeans do, when in Germany do as Germans do, you know, and so I mean my heart is here. You know, everything I've done has been what can I do to help enable the European ecosystem, the entrepreneurs that are here, the innovation ecosystem, like what can I do to help like women and, and business and society, et cetera. And, um, you know, I just would like the same, I think, type of consideration. Well, you definitely deserve it, and I, I would like to see you get that as well. But I also feel that you're, you, like you said earlier, you're truly a global citizen. So yes, when you're in Europe, you're, uh, you, you definitely have that um, equality, that inclusiveness there, as as far as you know, trying to really keep diversity and and keep the the voice and the messages uh, going strong. But it's really we're we're all distant cousins. We're all on the same spaceship Earth. There's this uh, these operating systems that we've been uh, working with and uh, civilization frameworks. They're just not they're not working for us all anymore. And this uh, this yeah this pandemic has really been probably the biggest microscope to to shine on where all the systemic problems are, where the problems that need to be fixed, what, what should we change? How can we improve? How can we come together? Um, and, um, and it takes an uh, army too, you know, it takes yeah. an army. I mean, and I think the one thing for me, like my aha moment is like, I've always been the one to be able to step out my box and kind of like see what everybody else would feel. I'm always usually the only one at the table, the quote unquote, uh, one different person. Um, and, you know, I think that that also gets old. And I think for me, I just kind of during the pandemic, I just have like put on the brakes, you know, like I'm not, I've made the decision that it's not my responsibility to try to, you know, to try to open the eyes of uh, everyone else. And I think for the majority of my life and the majority of my career, I mean, I've done that, like not consciously, but subconsciously, you know, growing up in Kansas, you know, there's not a lot of black people. Uh, <laughs> and then also I went to the school, you know, a private school and, you know, I was like one, uh, you know, one brown skinned person. And I think a couple of years, a couple others came, but I mean, I think by default, I've, I've just always been in a situation where I've had to like show other people, you know, or enlighten other people. And then I just realized that, you know, it's time for me to be enlightened, you know, like, and so I think that that's the biggest change uh, that has happened to me during the pandemic. And then also like, there's been so many things I've been quiet about um, throughout the years, just because I haven't wanted to like disrupt anything. But the truth is it's already disrupted. I mean, like the fact is like, you know, people, if people aren't going to give you an opportunity or if people think that you're this way or that way, they're going to think that regardless of what you do or how you act. So I realized like, I need to stop like, you know, kind of being my, like button things up and like trying to be exactly like the other people when I wish that they would actually try to be exactly like me. So that's been the biggest change. And it's been really a great relief to be quite honest um and it's been great just to say what i have to say and, and say how certain things have made me feel um and then um you know it's been weird though because i'll say like someone did something recently a few weeks ago and i knew that i was like kind of like the only one like it was a last minute decision but they were like oh my god we need to show or act like we're inclusive so who's the other one black person that i know or the one black woman that i know that's in europe because you know i can check off the european box i can check off oh she's black oh she's a woman type of thing and I basically like kind of called them out and I was like look you know I'm happy first of all that you do know me and that you did invite me last minute but let's just keep it real and let's I just want you to be aware that that's why and that's what happened and then to be told that they were hurt or disappointed by that and I was like okay imagine then how I felt like let's not tell you the number of years of my life that I felt that way. Like, if you feel like I've hurt you because I brought that up, then I, I guess triple that or make it times 10 of what you feel. And then maybe at this point, you'll change your behavior or be aware that that's how you make other people feel. 
who are different next time you wait last minute to ask them to join your panel or something like that. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I definitely know, I, not personally, but I kind of can tell what, what you're feeling. And I, I, I would say I can, I can feel for you what you're going through. I, I've, and just honestly, I have to bring out some truths and in my podcast, um, I don't think I'm, I'm not sure I have very many diverse people, um, listen, listeners that is. And, um, I had a wonderful, uh, lady, uh, uh, professor Shalanda Baker on the show. Uh, she's from, she was living in Boston at the time, but, uh, she's, she wrote a book for Island press and I was reviewing her book and had her on the podcast. It was one of the best podcasts I'd had. And I was so excited. And in the podcast, I actually talk about how, um, because it, it was right after the, the riots, but it was also right at the time that we knew that uh, Biden and, and, and uh, Kamala were going to, to be the next uh, moving into the White House and, and uh, taking over and, and uh, were really positive and excited about it. But she, she was uh, a lawyer that dealt with um, racial inequalities around energy and uh, energy deserts, energy uh, security, energy issues, and, uh, especially with renewables and indigenous people and things. And uh, I, I says, you know, the Biden, Biden Harris administration would be so excited to have you and, and uh, you're really going to help them. And she like kind of froze and she looked and she like, she couldn't say anything. But then when the podcast came out, she was made uh, deputy director of the Department of Energy. And we talked about that in the podcast. It was just so fabulous that, 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 that she was on the show and it was such an entertaining and it was really about basing needs. And it was hardly been watched. It's been listened to quite a bit. It's, uh, it's one of my top listens on the podcast. Really has hardly been even watched. And I'm like, do I have a bunch of racists that are my listeners or what, what's the reason it's so fabulous. I even went and did extra promotions. I was like, you know, and it just doesn't make sense. And then I also, I also had um, a new SDG advocate uh, for a couple of years now, um, Hindu Ibrahim, Hindu Umaru Ibrahim uh, from Chad. She's a, the head of the indigenous tribes and she was on it she she got a lot of evidence but she's also a superstar but shalanda was superstar as well and i think there's just some in europe and, and and all over the world there's just people that just don't get it yet they don't understand that we're all distant cousins that there is no difference between yeah. between us it's just there's something there that i don't know i mean i don't think it's because like people don't get it i just think again it's like i think the more your dinner table looks different for example and the more your office cafeteria or your team looks different i mean it just becomes like a natural thing like you'll listen to whoever regardless of whatever as long as the content is something of interest right and i think it just goes back it's not about race it's not about gender I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with like your interest. And so the, the, so for me, the way I was raised, my dad always said, you know, like start with everything else and then use that, you know, maybe it's because you have nice melanin last. And maybe it's just because the topic she was talking about isn't something that people are at this point in time taking time to care about. So it could be, a, it could have been a topic issue, you know, in terms of what she was discussing um, more than anything. And then maybe later it could have been all those other things. But I just think at the top of everyone's mind, it's probably not like legal issues around energy, renewable energies. It's more like issues of like, what am I going to eat? Am I going to be safe going to the grocery store? Uh, like, oh my God, you know, when I, when am I going to get my vaccine or, you know, what's going on with this pandemic? So, you know, I think the one thing we realized during the pandemic, like we all are the same in the sense, like we want to make sure we're healthy. We want to make sure we have food to eat and we want to make sure that we're surrounded by like a safe environment. 
you know? And I think that all of us are, are, are what we thought was important before has shifted. You know, like, I mean, like I could spit off like a whole bunch of like technological numbers and molecular biological and this and that and that. But right now it's like, I just like want to have like common talk. I don't need to, I, people can Google, like if I want to talk about the number of folks that are waste, you know, like tons of waste per year or this or that, you know, sometimes you see, you know, some of these talks and people are like, well, this percentage of, you know, and then some people get all impressed, but I'm like, that stuff is all on the Wikipedia now. So instead bring out your personality, bring out like kind of the way that you're going to impact things, the way that you're going to make change happen and your influence. And to me, I think that human factor is like become a a lot more relevant right now than anything and being able to keep it real. And I think um, post pandemic, the way that I'll also change is like, you know, I never have gravity, you know, this mark, I've never gravitated towards bullshit. I don't get impressed by like people spitting off this or that or how much, you know, money somebody has. I actually watch people and I've watched them over the years in terms of how they treat other people. And do they give to people and do they still want to interact with people even when quote unquote, those people can't do something for them? Um, one thing that I noticed is when I was like the global head of innovation for Metro Group and scouting inclusion for Metro Group, everybody wanted to talk to me. The moment that I took my separation package, all of a sudden it was like, man, you could hear like a little, I don't know, you could hear like little tweet tweet. Like if there was a little mosquito or something, you could hear it just so loud because all of a sudden like people were like, well, she can't really help us anymore. And the truth is I wasn't really trying to help most of the people anyway, even when I was there, just because I knew that they, I could tell uh, that, that their intentions were the wrong intentions. They didn't care about me. They didn't care about what was really happening. They didn't care about the innovative solutions. They just cared about what can you make a connection here and there? And this goes what back. What can you do for me? What can yeah. you do for me? And the one thing that you're going to realize, and I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I think as a woman of color, where I've always had to do everything and go above and beyond, I mean, I know that the majority of people, they always want some connection or something, but they never keep me in the mix. Like even now more than ever, I'm really, really more than ever really not interested in helping. I mean, I really care about people who really care about me. And, and what I bring to the table and my spirit and want to help me because I definitely have helped people all my life, some out of necessity and some just out of the fact that I'm from Kansas and I'm a good person. I was a Girl Scout for 13 years. I love it, I love it. You know, uh, I've seen in, in your background all the beautiful records of uh, many I like, Fast Domino and, and, and uh, it it reminds me i used to be uh kind of almost it was almost a, a, i i didn't see it at all but when i was younger and growing up in in high school college days i was a big dj i dj'd a lot i was on, i was fortunate enough to get on a radio station and i was the only white guy in a, a whole radio station the, the whole radio station was uh Rhythm of the city, uh, new new jazz, uh, rhythm, soul, and and new rap, you know, um, and I, I I had the probably the cruddiest job there, but I just loved it. I loved the music. I loved the people. You know, we we do these parties. I was the only white guy that show up, you know, but uh, it was just so much fun, and I, I didn't ever didn't ever realize that my 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 family and parents they thought you know. Mark is weird. He's he he's kind of a weird guy, but that you know when I look at those records and your great taste and and music and that I you know I'm, it reminds me of those you know, hidden things from from my past that uh, I just think it makes for a better life. It makes for a better world when we all feel like we're together. That there are you know there is no difference between us. That we're all here on the same spaceship Earth and. And that we need to flip the switch. And that's why it's so fitting that today is, you know, International Women's Day, but also that we really, uh, we just had uh, uh, the, the whole Black Month uh, as well, just uh, finished up. And, and uh, so many, so many fabulous things are going on. What? 
Yeah, I'm gonna stop you there. You know what's so funny though? I mean, please don't think that just because uh, black, uh, don't think also uh, that black people love other black people either. I mean, I can honestly tell you, I've reached out even to some black people and they still don't even contact me. I mean, there's just, and I think that this is what's so bad is like a domino effect. Same like with women, that there's few women in a certain field like finance and things like that. And if you're usually the only woman, you know, I don't think people are really talking about how hard it is to be uh, inclusive even of other women. If you've been in this atmosphere where it was so hard for you to get there yourself and you kind of like, you, and you, you get in this routine you know, where you're like doing everything above and beyond, you finally have gotten your acceptance. It's like people aren't really talking about the psychological behavior and the thing that happens. Then, then another woman comes along when you're saying, hey, you got to have more women. I don't think we realize how then some of us or some women, they're like, oh, no, not another one. But I just got my place. You know, we so everybody yeah. has a, something to work on. And um, I've always been, though, the type of person, you know, because like I said, when I was growing up, there was few brown people. But when I went to college in Pennsylvania and anytime I go somewhere, I'm the person that sees somebody on the other side of the street. I'm like, hey, how are you? What's your name? And they're always like. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So what I'm saying is, you know, there's also but this also brings me to the point, like, you know, there was all this like uprising and and things like that. And I was like, we can't, you have to lead by example. We can't expect everybody and people to embrace us, for example, if we won't even embrace ourselves. If they see, like just with other women, if men see that you're mean or that you're disrespectful or you're that you're not inclusive to another woman that now all of a sudden is in your ecosystem, you're giving them a pass to do the same thing. And I think this is where we have to take responsibility for our actions. If you, so women out there, if you have a problem with another woman that may be entering your sphere, don't, don't necessarily portray that out in public, especially if it's more of a male dominated, take the person aside, tell them what your problem is. Don't, but don't, don't air the dirty laundry. You know, just we have to lead by example because people will always make an excuse to continue the bad, you know, ways that they act if they can. So let's just not give it to them. That's I agree. That's the, the other thing is, is, you know, we're, it's International Women's Day, but then we're talking about people of color. We're talking about racism. We're talking about all these because the, 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 the lines blur in many respects because they're all systemically kind of connected in one way or the other there's no way to just um i mean it has been done you know segregation and silo groups off into their individual but it's just a not not a model that works forever it, it's not a model that doesn't work period really um but and, and so a lot of these these lines blur as we talk about it you are working on or have been for quite some time on uh, inclusiveness and 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 inclu being inclusive and some things. Can you tell us about some of the projects, what you're working on, what your feelings are, uh, of where we need to go with, with that? Yeah, absolutely. So Bithouse Group actually was started like in 2007. And it was a result of me working like all these years in the biotech industry. One, there being so few women and definitely very few women who were like molecular biologists or then went to R&D sales and marketing and stuff like that and it was also started like you said that other layer um like i remember one of the companies i worked for like when i first was hired um i came in like it's one of the highest uh, paid which actually was still very like hard for like the bosses to believe but anyway they had to stick with industry stranders and they you know they had to take me from the other company by the time like year three, all of a sudden I was like the highest paid to like the second from the lowest on, on the team pay scale. And that was an aha moment for me because I, it wasn't like my pay increase um, got less due to my performance. It got less because I got labeled as the person that was difficult or uh, that had a, that was uh, angry or something like that, just because I was assertive when I realized that there were some racial 
um, and also some biases actually, um, as it related to my skill sets versus the rest of the skills on the team. And um, so Bithouse was formed as a result of that because I realized that in the process, I realized that I had to be quiet about what I knew just so I wouldn't piss off my boss who may have also been intimidated by me, hence why they kept saying, oh, you know, I wasn't a team player, which is so not the case, but that's actually how they were able to justify not giving me this, the increase every year. And so I went from here to here while everybody else went up because they liked them better or they said the right things or whatever. So. Uh, so Bitty House Group was formed as a result of that because I was thinking it was very important for people to be able to have a voice. And so that's why it was called, you know, the best in tech, but it's about minimizing barriers to entry. And it started out, the name was Strategic Diversity Group to get corporates to be open-minded, which we're seeing right now with these innovation challenges, to be open-minded about diverse um, solutions in order to run their businesses without people being penalized. So that's why I was called like out of the box strategic solutions uh, to kind of put that hashtag so people would know it's not gonna be a normal solution. It's gonna be a solution that you haven't heard before, but don't like penalize people for being smart and intelligent and thinking of something that may be a bit futuristic. So in terms of you ask the question, like where can we go or what are some solutions? I think we have to keep providing those safe spaces. There's like this space where everybody is and where you have to go by the, the traditional like corporate guidelines or business guidelines. But then I like how people are creating these moonshot spaces. So they know, you know, that when people move over here or they come contact strategic diversity group or bit house group, that you know that these are going to be like out of the box, kind of off the wall, kind of a little bit like, you know, they are logical and they are te technical and they are tangible, but you got to be in the brain space to accept that this is okay. And so I think if we keep creating these moonshot, these innovation programs and not after two years be like, oh, we don't have time for that. We need to always be innovative. The one thing the pandemic has taught every company, every person is that like, look, sure, let's sit in the boardroom for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and try to plan out step-by-step step exactly what's gonna happen. Or you can have the pandemic happen and then you have no choice. And as we've seen, the companies that were able to maneuver the fastest now all of a sudden are the companies that are on people's mind. It didn't matter if a company had a good brand or service for 25, 30, 50 years. What mattered was who right now came to rescue all of us during these really these disruptive times that we didn't foresee, but what we've been planning for for 15, 20 years. And then sometimes penalizing those brilliant people inside your company that kind of stuck outside the lines, but they were trying to say something, but we didn't want to listen because it was too much work. It, it was a little bit out of our realm because we'd have to maybe miss a vacation day or something like that. But at the end of the day, if you, you don't know, do the work, do the work. And it could be different. Do the work that you always do, but do work that's different work. So that's kind of my perspective. I, I love it. I love it. The hardest question I have for you today is the burning question, WTF. And no, it's not the swear word that, that everybody's been asking since the pandemic really hit and, and all the other craziness. It's what's the future and so i want to know not what you think governments or countries i want to know what you think what's your vision of the future what's the future jewel um as it relates to what you have to be a little bit more specific it's up to you and there is no specific it's you know what what do you think the future is what's your future what's your plan where where are you going if you're going to tell me say mark the future is this I see it as this. No, I'm putting you um, on the spot, but that's why it's the burning question. The future is um, uh, the awakening of all of us, uh, meaning um, people feeling comfortable bringing their whole selves, their entire selves um, to both work, to home, and even if uh, it's like, you know, they like to wear white sheets, 
with holes in the eyes. I mean, like, but still people being able to own up to that and be like, yeah, at night, you know, I creep and I'd be like, I have white sheets on and I go around trying to scare people <laughs> that don't look like me. Uh, but owning up to that and then being able to have these conversations as to where that comes from, you know? Like, uh, what, what, what is it like you feel like you could be a superhero? You know, what, what are you lacking at, at home? Maybe you don't feel like, you know, you're the man or the woman, you know, like, what is it that like makes us who we are? And being able to give people a space to conversate about that. So I think the future is about like the intersection of being your whole self, your entire self and like innovation and technology. Um, because I think the one thing that companies who have, for example, been able to continue and to continue financing their innovation ecosystems, um, even during the pandemic, they had to take a step back and then they went inside the company and looked at kind of maybe like already art research and development projects that, for example, they put a tap on because they were like, that was too much. That was, that was too much from our core business. I think what we realize is that core business is all business right now all potential opportunities so if you have like a lot of these untapped that you never you know it's time to tap into the things that you thought you didn't need to tap into before because you got comfortable with your current revenue stream because that's the other thing we realize there is no comfort all revenue streams are all over the place right now right so like there we realize that there's room for growth and opportunity and that we should hire people by the way and be attracted to people that can tap into those things that we thought we didn't need to tap into because that wasn't where our main revenue was coming from that's what i want to say <laughs> perfect i love it the uh, the the uh, first half of what you mentioned made me think of um this really hilarious uh, movie, but it was also very deep and very touching. I don't know if you saw it. It's called Jojo Rabbit. It's very applicable to to Germany where we're at because it has to do with it has to do with this um, this young uh, boy in, during the war, and he was part of the Hitler Youth, or kind of like the the the, the Boy Scouts for Hitler type of a deal. And um, it was called Jojo Rabbit and his best friend, his imaginary invisible friend, so to say, was Hitler, you know, and just some of the conversations between the two of them were, um, he realized that, the, no, that's not true. I don't hate those people and I don't uh, think that's correct. And, and um, by owning up and coming out and, and putting those things out in the open, like you said, you know, that's running around with a white sheet on, but uh, don't, don't hide, don't hide. Let's throw off the, let's throw off the covers and, and really get into yeah. a conversation about it. And, and uh, the thing is, is most of the conversations, especially, I mean, that, that were heard during the, the inauguration and Trump and then all that and all, um, there, there wasn't a lot of intellectual conversation. There wasn't a lot of conversations of depth and substance. And once you get to the root of, you know, asking a few questions back and forth, it's like, yeah, because you know, I can what, respect the reality. I can respect that someone that says, look, I prefer to wear white sheets and I totally don't like brown people versus me actually having to have coffee with them on a regular basis, then pretending that they don't have a problem with me. And that's why at the end of the day, I may not get that paycheck because at the end of the day, there may be some deep rooted. Now I could save a whole lot of time. Everybody could save a whole lot of time. If it's kind of, I, I can respect that. I can respect if you say, look, I don't like brown people. I'll never like brown people. I, I think women, they just need to be at home. I'll be like, you know what? I totally respect that. And you know what? You're exactly, I, I don't think I need to spend any more of my time conversing with you. Thank you very much for freeing up my time to give it towards a situation that's going to cultivate like kind of a little bit more of a kumbaya or, or like, you know, a better outcome. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you for sharing. So just everybody should bring their entire self to the table. People could save a lot of time and energy 
because time is money, money is time. And, you know, instead of like this uphill battle, it, it could be easy. Like, let's keep it simple. I agree. I agree. Um, really, these last three questions that I have for you are for my guests. They're for my listeners uh, as well that are a takeaway for them to help better their lives. And if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Um, listen to yourself. Don't listen to other people. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Um, if they're in the science field, which I started out um, in, just know that there's such a world of opportunities out there. Um, you can save people. You don't need to, for example, where even if it's a rare uh, disease or something that you wanna try to solve or cure, don't let your professors or anybody else like talk you out of it. Just say, no, this is what I wanna do and make sure that you surround yourself with the people that wanna help support you get there. Um, as it relates to um, helping with diversity, inclusion and technology, we have a long way to go. Uh, let's not just use the buzzwords. Uh, let's make sure that the products or the services that we create um, basically have all types of people at the table, all types of engineers or programmers. And if they aren't programming, make sure they're spending time with your programmers. I mean, old people. I mean, like green people. I mean, yellow people. I mean, I mean, all types of people, people that are disabled, everybody. These products and services that we're making, we don't need to worry about once we've tapped out and, and kind of capitalize on all the markets that we thought we wanted to target, we don't then need to go back and say, oh yeah, now we need to worry about women liking this hardware product, or now we need to worry about if an old person can use it. This should be at the very forefront when you're making these products and these services. Like you may not like put your all your money in marketing towards that, but at the very beginning, you have to realize it actually changes the whole code. If you can already cope, why are we wasting all this money when we got to have to then backtrack and say, oh, yeah, we forgot that this uh, artificial intelligence solution, like it was, there was a mishap because that old person was moving a little bit slower than we thought and then actually didn't see them in the thing, you know, start that at the beginning. That's like a waste of money and give that money to somebody that could use it. But you have to be inclusive of like what needs to be written in the code to create products and services that everybody can use regardless of if that's your first go-to-market strategy. Now, as it relates to sustainability, now we need to make sure, now we know that most things, especially products, are expensive, which by default, I think we also make the assumption that maybe certain people don't matter when it comes to us like doing our market research and things like that. Now, Sustainability, if you're not using it as a buzzword, means that you know, you're supposed to care about all of mankind and the all of environment, not just the pretty spaces. I'm talking about the barren spaces. I'm talking about the spaces that you probably don't even know what the name is. So what that means is we need as many people as possible. Rolling the word sustainability, sustainable development goals off of their tongues. And that comes from education. Education is something that should be available to everybody. Again, green, purple, tall, short, young, old, whatever. We need to make sure that we are sustainably inclusive that people know about water systems, that people know about supply chain, food sourcing, everything we need to know about the climate, innovation. We need to educate and we need to be inclusive. We need to provide internships. We need to go out of our way to not do the thing that's easy. Oh, let's just ask so-and-so or so-and-so because they know so-and-so and so-and-so, no. Talk to somebody and bring in, seek people, regions, products, services, whatever you don't know about. 
you know, like go on a mission, use 20% of your time in situations that you know nothing about. 20% of your time with people you don't know or weren't referred to. If we start with 20%, then maybe two years later, we can go to 40%. And then we can finally by maybe in seven years be at 50, 50, 50 people, I, percent of people I know or resources I know or things I know about and then 50% I don't. And I think that that way the world would be a better place. We gotta, we have to really reserve 20% of our time and our ecosystem and the way we function, the way we work, the way we talk, the way we eat, everything to something that is unknown. I really uh, liked what you said because um, inclusivity, but also um, writing it into, into the code. This is, and we can tie it to the sustainable development goals, but we can tie it to anything else. Um, the sustainable development goals aren't an add-on that you add to the economy or to our world operating system after it's already been built. It's something that's deeply ingrained from the beginning. It's deeply ingrained in the code from the beginning. It's not like when you get done with the code and you say, oh, we left out people of color. We left out the elderly. We left out uh, these purple and yellow people. That, that, and we got, oh, we got to pop in an add-on. Here's a little plug-in. Okay, no, that, it don't work like that. that that's a broken system. That's not going to function. Uh, that's not how the world works. And what most people don't understand is the all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, not only are the world's first ever global moonshot ever, a historical precedence never seen in humanity's history ever before, that 197 countries came together and agreed on a roadmap, a plan for our future. And it's not an add-on. It's an entirely new economy. It's an entirely new operating system. It is not an add-on or tweak. It is a new way. It's that, you know, and that's kind of um, one, one reason why I asked the question, you know, what's the future? I, I, I want people um, to tell me what the plan is for the future. What, what's the goal? What's the plan? What's the, the model for the future? And I, I have... Until now, I have nobody says, oh, it's the sustainable development goals, it's the Paris Agreement, it's the green, the new green deal, it's the donut economics, it's the planetary boundaries. None of them, they're like, uh, you know, they all have their own thing. I'll tell you what, it's a his the SDGs and the Paris Agreement are historical precedents, but they're only the only global goal or roadmap to the future that we have. I don't know of any other ones that have been as well thought out, planned out, and inclusive of everyone. Women, all ethnicities, uh, everything is thought of in that plan. And it's not an add-on. It needs to be ingrained deep into the code of the, the great reset, the new beginning towards a, a, a better infrastructure for the world. And so I love right how you said that. I agree. And the deal is, you know, throughout my career, like a lot of people have said, but you started out as a biologist. How is it that you've done this, 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 and this, and this? And this is the one thing, the biggest difference in Europe. So Europe, you know, you go, you, you go to school and you have one trade and then you get a PhD and you do this like all your life, right? Until you um, die, like, yeah. Right. The one thing that we're realizing also, like, I think with the impacts of the pandemic, as well as like, even like you said, the SDGs, you need, there's one common pillar and one common pillar is like society or two, society and environment. And with that comes all these other industries. So I, I love it when people ask me like, well, how could you do that? Or like, you know, God, you like done all the, I'm like, yeah, but the pillar has always been innovation and technology, right? It doesn't matter. Those things are industry agnostic. Every Every industry needs to innovate. There is a science to every single thing, you know, like, so yeah, I was a molecular biologist. So it's about the DNA and then making sure that you have the right elements, you know, in the middle of the nucleus. So no matter how much, and when we grow and evolve like us, we grow and evolve every year, but we all start out with the right chromosomes or the DNA that then has evolved as we've gotten taller or older or our body, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. It's about starting with the right, like, kind of like elements, the right building seeds. blocks, code elements, the right yeah. seeds. 
And so all my life, I've focused on the right season, like being in science has been able to help. So I can work in any industry because I'm always trying to get to the root of how it works. And then that module of like the specifics of the industry, that's like 20% of actually what you need to know to be in that industry. Every business has the same situation. They need to know what products to bring to market. They need to know, you know, how to position it in the market. They need to know, like, how to generate sales. They need to know how to reach customers and engagement and loyalty. Those things are industry diagnostic. Yeah, yeah I love it. The, the last question I have for you is what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? I think I've learned it's not always what you know, it's like maybe more of who you know. And I think that um, women and specifically minority parents need to also tell their children how important it is for them to socialize and to network and not just be like, you need to be 10 times better than everyone else. Because the one thing I've realized is that knowing what I know and knowing how to do my jobs, that's been like the scariest thing for everybody that has been in my jobs or been trying to hire me for the jobs. Um, it's like, I feel like I would have, and the, when, the more that I tone down and acted maybe like I didn't have a brain, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but the more comfortable people felt and so I think it's about networking. We can't like guilt trip our children, you know, just because their education is expensive or like life is hard to be like, you know, no matter what, make sure you study all the time, make sure you know everything. That doesn't help you as much as making sure that people, uh, that you know the right people. So um, uh, there's a, author, his name is John P. Strelecki, he's a friend of mine, and uh, it's actually one of the very first podcasts that I started with, and he wrote a bunch of books, The Y Cafe and Big Five for Life, but he always says, you know, if you want to be a scientist, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to save the world or do, um, uh, do anything, he says, find the who, it's not the why or your purpose, those are important, but find the person who has already done that, who's paved the way, who's done it different than others, uh, and see if you're aligned and then go out and either read everything they've done, watch the videos, try to contact them directly and get their mentorship and find out how they did it and then follow that lead. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And so I like that. Uh, that really ties to this networking and, and that journey that you've had before. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, as you have other degrees and experiences, but I use them in a much different way. Uh, now today, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, out there every day on the farm. I'm not, uh, you know, doing economics or producing food in, in the way um, that most people would think but doing it in a different way. And that's because I've found a way that all that education and experience can work for me. And I really appreciate your time today, Jewel. It's been so good to talk to you and catch up and get your points of view on this wonderful International Women's Day. And I wish you all the best. And unless you have something else you'd like to add or say, we're done. I'm, I, I really appreciate your time. Your for those name. of you who have noticed, you know, during our podcast, my record fell off the wall. <laughs> so I, just wanted add, Gay. I wanted to add a little bit of comedy but this is like my favorite record um and these records are actually uh, my dad's old collection and some of you know um he actually passed away my sophomore year of college um and every time i go back to kansas i try to bring as many as i can that are fit in my suitcase without like having me making me pay extra baggage uh, because he has a wonderful collection. I have about 250 more records to go. So whenever I play his old records that we used to dance to and family, family night on Friday nights in the, in the, in the family room, um, it's really, really great and good for my soul. So I got my nice Technic turntables usually on Sunday. It's like me and Pops with his music and uh, me and my cup of coffee. So uh, first of all, let's always ask the question, what's going on? And then let's always try to figure out how we can do something 
to, to, to solve what may be going on, especially if it's not right. Thanks so much, Joe. You have a wonderful day and we'll talk very Thanks, soon. Mark.